Well, today I'm coming to you guys with a mini series called, Are You Sure? Okay, and uh, it's a short series that's going to be based around not only the solid nature of our creator, but it's also going to be based on um, the surety is on our part as believers in our relationship with our maker. So, all right. So I'm going to do a quick exercise with you. And I do this in the classroom with my students. All right. So it's just second nature for me. So you'll give me a thumbs up if you agree and you give me a thumbs down if you disagree. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. All right. So you're going to give me a thumbs up if you agree that the statement I'm going to read is about someone being sure or unsure. All right, thumbs up if you think it's being sure, thumbs down if you think it's being unsure, all right? So once all villagers decided to pray for rain, on the day of prayer, all of the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. Thumbs up or down if you think that was them being sure. The boy. The boy. The boy being sure. The boy being sure. Okay. When you throw a baby into the air, he or she laughs because he or she knows that you will catch them. Okay. Every night before we go to bed, without any assurance of being alive, being alive the next morning, we, we get to set our alarm clocks to wake up. Okay. We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. Okay. Uh, and this one will go specifically uh, to married people. It says, we see the world suffering, but yet we still get married. Thumbs up and down. <laughs> Do don't, all right. <laughs> All right, that was a joke question. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. If you could with me, please turn to Psalms, the 103rd chapter. Psalms, chapter 103. And when you get there, say amen. Amen. All right, in the, in the 103rd chapter of Psalms, it says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers our dust. He remembers that we are dust. Verse. Psalms 103, I'm sorry, verse 13. Starting to verse 13, I'll start over. Yeah. As, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place, remember, and, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And so as we examine the surety of our faith, the first question we ask is, are we sure? And as we look at the sure nature of what we believe in our creator, we have to, I don't believe we can look at it completely accurately without realizing that we as mankind, as humankind, we, we come with a fickle nature. We we're not as sure as we could be. We may not be as sure as we want to be. Turn me to Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here a while while I go and pray. And he took with them, with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So to an extent, there's a purpose behind why Jesus decided to bring those disciples with him. He was relying on them to an extent. 
It says he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. The fickle nature of mankind. He was relying on them to, to be with him during a really, really tough time, during a tough moment. But the fickle nature of mankind took over. Verse 42, it says it again, a second time, he went away and prayed saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them sleep again. For their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said, are you still sleeping and resting? Now, I'm sure the disciples meant well. I'm sure the disciples wanted to be there for Jesus in that moment. They were sh I'm sure they were sure of all of the words that he had spoken to them leading up to that moment. They were sure of it. They had times of doubt, but overall they were faithful followers. But not once, not twice, but even three times we see the fickle nature of who they are. It took over. So the question is asked, are you sure? Are you sure? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, one chapter over. And we look oftentimes uh, in different parts, even in today, uh, a lot of people have biblical names. I have a biblical name, my brother has a biblical name, right? Um, and so the person I'm about to read about, it's the reason why people, you don't really hear named Judas at all. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse three, it says, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, he was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and to the elder saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is it? What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hang himself. So a lot of time we we look at we look at Judas and we condemn him because of his actions. Like man, you betrayed Jesus, you betrayed the Son of God. But that was a that was an example of being fickle in nature. We don't sometimes we don't also we don't look at the part of the story where Judas was remorseful. As wrong as he was, he felt bad for what he did. Even though what the disciples did when, by falling asleep, even though what they did wasn't necessarily evil, they, they, there was a bit of remorse in them. These are examples of the fickle nature that we have. Even as we are as sure as we think we are, as we want to be, it's the fickle nature in us that can sometimes get in the way. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And so as we examine the surety of our faith, as we examine the, the surety of our God and our creator and our maker, we have to we cannot overlook the nature that we as individuals constantly fight, constantly battle. That will show up time and time again. You don't have to turn there, but in Jeremiah chapter 17, it says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And what Jeremiah is trying to communicate is that despite, sometimes despite our good intentions, the essence and the core of who we are goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It shows up. It rears its ugly head. It shows who we are, which is fickle in nature a lot of times. So I'm not saying that we can't ever trust people, right? We have different types of people on earth that we need. We need doctors. We need teachers. We need lawyers. We need dentists. We need teachers. 
right? We need teachers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We need, yes, we need those. We need those teachers. We need these people, right? Because everybody serves a different purpose. So I'm not saying you, can, you can't ever trust people or that people are all bad, but I'm just simply saying that our fickle nature is a part of who we are as it relates to our creator. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> You see, you see the look on the, you see the look on Daniel's face when he's a baby, right? <laughs> Turn with me to John chapter six, and as a part of the surety of our relationship with our Creator, as a part of that, Jesus made a lot of statements, and he wasn't always he really wasn't concerned about. Well, we'll say he was more concerned with giving out the truth than he was about offending people. And in the sixth chapter of John, starting in verse 22, it's the beginning of a series of statements that disturbed a bunch of people that were around him to varying degrees. Verse 22, it says, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which the disciples had entered, and Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias. Go down to verse 27. It says, do not labor for the food with perishes. So prior to this time period, Jesus had just miraculously fed thousands upon thousands of people. And so naturally, when you perform a miracle like this, people are going to be seeking you for various reasons. And so Jesus' primary goal was to explain to people that not only is the physical important, but the spiritual is more important. And so he's saying that you all came, you all came to me and you're coming to me now because you saw what I just did. I just fed you all. But I want to show you a, a deeper truth and illustrate that through my, act, through my physical actions. Let's skip down to verse 33. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Verse 44, it says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. So he's describing in intimate detail his relationship with the father. He's laying out the structure of the relationship between him, the father and the belief and the believers, us. He says in verse 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Down to verse 60. He says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Part of, the, part of our relationship with the surety of us and our creator is our response to God. How do we respond to his message? How do we respond to what he expects of us? It says the disciples, they heard this, some of them. This is a hard saying, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the son of man descend where he was before? So right here, he's talking about a larger group of followers, not, not just his, his 12 disciples that were in his inner circle. These are a larger group of people who claim to have a relationship with him. So they didn't see him every day, but they heard about him and they knew about him and they considered themselves disciples. And so he's like, if you have a problem with what I just laid out to you and told you that no one can come to me, come, come to the father except through me. 
if you have a problem with me being the middleman, then you're really going to have a problem with what I'm about to say as far as me ascending back to where I was. He says, I left my throne and I wrapped myself in human flesh for you. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Down to verse 65. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That was their response. What he said offended them so bad that they just, they decided to stop following him. It's a lesson for our response. Jesus was sure of the words that he spoke. There were people that were following him that were claiming a relationship with him. They were sure of the words that he spoke. But look at their response, though. What is our response to the sure nature of what we believe? Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, there's a story about this man who was demon-possessed, and he had great supernatural strength because uh, he, was, he was spiritually influenced, right? And so he was just, basically, he was out of control. He was so out of control that they had to tie him up. And there were times that they would tie him up, he was still getting loose, right? And so one day, Jesus came along with his disciples to set this man free. So verse six, he says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Verse six, Mark chapter five, verse six. And then verse eight, he says, for he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. All the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine and the herd ran violently down into the sea and and drowned into the sea. Verse 14, and those who fed the swine and they told it in the city and the country. So the people who were standing by, they're, they're telling the story of what happened to other people. Verse 15, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. Verse 16, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from the region. Their response was for you to leave. They saw Jesus perform this miracle and they wanted him to go. They weren't, I can imagine in their minds that they weren't entirely sure of what they just witnessed with their own eyes. They're like, this is kind of a good thing, but it's kind of not, and I don't completely understand it. So it's the fear of the unknown, so I want you to leave. That was their response. Verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not let him. But what was the response of the man who, was, who Christ had just set free? That was, that was his, his, his response was, one of gratefulness. He had a grateful attitude. He was, he was, uh, it was unbelievably, it was unbelievable how for him to actually be delivered. So much so he wanted to follow him. He wanted to be with him. He was sure that he had been changed. He was sure that he had been transformed. His response is an example of what our response should be. To have a grateful attitude 
and to want to be with the one who has set us free because we've all been set free in one way or another. The Bible says that he came to set the captive free. That is our response. That's what our response should be. So do we ever consider that sometimes we may not look at it like that, but we, we are in a relationship with our creator. And what if you had a relationship with someone or something and it was one-sided? You wouldn't, you wouldn't consider that to be too much of a relationship. Jesus' message was that he was always sure of who he was and why he was sent. He was always sure of his own identity, even if other people were mistaken of his identity. Even if they didn't know, he always knew. Next, we're going to look at Jesus, who was always continually sure of his purpose and his plan. Turn over a few chapters to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to go down to verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say you're a prophet. But he said, who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should go and tell no one about this. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And he spoke these words openly. In verse 32, he says, he spoke these words openly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God. Jesus was always sure about his purpose and his plans. How many times throughout scripture did he predict not only his own death, but he predicted the resurrection, his resurrection? He was sure about that. He knew that a part of the plan was for him to come down to earth to save us. And he never wavered in that. He was sure. He had complete confidence that the father would raise him back to life. And he's our elder brother. So we should have the same confidence that one day when we die, not if, but when, we will be raised back to life. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. You see a story about a man named Paul. And Paul, Paul had a situation. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. It says, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to, to hear, to be or hears from me. It's amazing that in Paul's letters, he was always, always writing from the perspective of being a, an example for people. He, he knew and he was always aware and he was conscious of what his actions meant to the people that he was writing to. Because he didn't want he didn't he didn't want them to be thrown off 
and especially during a time period when he's laying the foundation for doctrine and belief. So he's always explaining why he's doing something or why not, why he's not doing something. In verse seven, it says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So he's saying this is a trial and a, and, and a situation that's, that's happening right now so that I don't get too far ahead of myself, so that I don't think more highly of myself than I should. It says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, that I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong takes a lot to say that yeah. it's, a, it's, it's easier to read about someone else's trials and temptations thousands of years later and say well that's what we should do but it doesn't make it any less true god is saying in this situation that he is doing what's best for paul and despite Paul's pain and suffering, he was sure of it. Paul was sure that even if God doesn't do what I want him to do or what I expect him to do, I'm sure that whatever he does is what's best for me. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to, to, to that's a hard reality. Because you have seen the power of God. You know how God has moved. You know the things that he's done for you prior to this moment. And you still come away with the conclusion that when I, that this situation right now is for my, it's, it's for my best. They say that there are a few guarantees in life, death and taxes. <laughs> We have many, we have many more guarantees. We have many more things to be sure about. In the same book, we flip back to verse one. I mean, chapter one, Second Corinthians chapter one. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. Yes and amen. To the glory of God through us. So I want to add a few things onto that list of death and taxes. <laughs> right along in that same category is the promises of God. Now, you know, I couldn't make it through a whole message without giving you guys a sports analogy. So back when I was younger, there was this professional basketball player in the NBA. His name was Rasheed Wallace. And Rasheed Wallace played for this team called the Detroit Pistons. And one year, they were in the playoffs against this uh, team called the Cleveland Cavaliers, and they had this player named LeBron James. Y'all may have heard of him, right? And so after, in a moment of frustration after game one, Rasheed Wallace was talking to the the, the reporters after, afterwards in game one, and he uh, guaranteed that they were going to win the next game. He said, I don't care what happened in game one, we're going to win game two. Y'all can put it on the front page, back page, you can put it where. This is, this is what this is what he said. So his name is Rasheed, so they called it. So actually, so it went on to game two, and it turns out that he was right. So they called it a guarantee. <laughs> he guaranteed, and he did that more than one time, so he did it twice, I think, in his career. And so it got me to thinking about the things that actually matter, right, first of all, and the things that are guaranteed in life. Winning game two, we might all might not win game two. 
but we all do have the promise that we can go before our father and that we can go before him and, and tell him what we need because he knows what we need before we even ask. Turn with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter. No, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter two, Philippians chapter two. And we're gonna start at verse nine. It says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those in heaven, those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's another guarantee. Every knee will bow. Regardless of what you believe, regardless of where you grew up, regardless of, of your life experiences, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. In Habakkuk chapter two, it says that there's going to be a time period that comes where the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters covers the sea, which means there will, there will be nowhere on earth where people don't know about God. Just like the waters cover the sea, the knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth. It's not going to be this God and that God and hundreds of other guys that you pray to or a reality where you have no God. It's a guarantee. God was sure when he said this through the, create, through, through the writers of this book. Turn me to John chapter 14. John. Chapter 14, in verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. I love how he would take uh, his disciples' uh, statements and and turn it into an opportunity to explain a, a spiritual truth. And sometimes you're thinking like, man, he could have he, he gave him an easier response. But he's like, no, nah, I'm going to take this. I'm going to use this opportunity as a teaching moment. So he's like, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. That's how closely, that's how cool we are. That's our relationship. It's kind of like how if, if someone doesn't know God, if they, if they see us, then they see Christ. Should be. If they would have saw me uh, driving over here today to church, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have. <laughs> I really thought this driver was going to cut me off. So I, I was, I listen, I looked over, I gave him a hard look. You know that look when you look over there? I gave, I gave it to him. It was an older lady, so I felt bad now. <laughs> It was a younger dude. He was younger than me. I was like, dude, you got to know how to drive. Man. Come on. So, so, yeah, so if you see us, then you should see Christ. So it goes down, and he says, do you, do you not believe, verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Someone who is making these statements, they, these are very serious statements to be made. So much so they sought to kill him. Imagine saying something so bad people want to kill you. <laughs> they want to kill you. They don't want to just hurt you. One time it got so bad that Jesus had to supernaturally escape out of their, out of their hands. They were coming after him and he just supernaturally just got out of the way. These are statements that he's making, but these, these aren't statements that are made by somebody that's unsure about themselves. He knows what he's saying. He's like, I'm not concerned about if this hurts your feelings or not. 
I'm more concerned about you understanding why I came down here. Verse 12, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Go down to verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. Verse 19, he says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more but you will see me again. He's predicting his death. Not like, you know, famous rappers and different people like that who manifest this stuff, which sometimes can influence that, but he's telling you ahead of time, like I'm, I'm about to leave and it's for your benefit. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. These are guarantees. These are statements made by someone who is sure of them, of themselves. Can you read verse 19 too? Verse 19. Yeah. It says a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. And even in verse one, this is the one I really want to hit. Verse one, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. If you look at uh, mankind and, and the history of man, at any point in history, you, you can apply what he's saying to us. You can apply what he's trying to communicate to us. He's saying there's never going to be a time period where people don't know me. There's never going to be a time period where people aren't claiming there's another way. There's never going to be a time period. So I'm telling you in verse one, like he says, don't let your heart be troubled. It's always going to be somebody. Even when, even when um, the lady came and she put the perfume on his feet and the disciples were, they were, uh, the other father, they were upset. And what did he tell him? He said, the poor you're going to have with you always. Always. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And he goes on later on and he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. These are guarantees from our creator. And so as I close, I always like to focus on the actuality of the sure things that we have in our life. The world will tell us that, we, that there are other things that are, uh, um, that are certain like death and taxes, but we can also respond and let them know that there are a lot of guarantees and there are a lot of promises that are just as sure, that are just as sure. And our last verse turned me to Matthew chapter 27. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. When you get there, say, he's almost done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to see the baby's face? <laughs> <laughs> if y'all want to see Daniel's baby face, just ask for him, okay? You don't have to have me put it up. There. So in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, 
It says, I'm just trying to pull up right now. No, it's a, uh, verse 34, it says, now surely, Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This is the guarantee that we have from our creator and our maker, that no matter what we see, no matter what we feel, no matter what we go through, the word tells us another truth, and we use that truth as we go throughout our daily lives to help us combat the enemy, because we are sure of not only ourselves and our limitations as believers, but we're sure of the rock-solid nature of the creator, the one who made us. God bless. Yes, thank you.